I thought the opening was uh, incredible. It reminded me, I don't know, maybe you saw the film Duel by Spielberg when the truck is following the other car. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, um, thanks so much. Duel is, you know, is certainly one of the, um, you know, films we kind of look to, to, you know, to sort of build out the characterization of the white van. Uh, it's funny enough, not, not only Duel and Spielberg, but, um, you know, Jaws was another comp that we, uh, this cinematographer and, and myself and the lighting of the van and um, the angles on the van and, you know, how to, how to keep it the most menacing and ominous, um, you know, presence that it, it could have in the film. Uh, because that particular van, the 1973 Ford Econoline, sorry, Ford, um, <laughs> it has a, an aspect of it that, can be very comical if you shoot it in a wrong angle. It can look like the you know the mystery van from from Scooby Doo, which would be the last thing that we're going for here in a, a suspense thriller, right? No, but the white van was very very scary in the way you presented it. So the opening was a uh, a great was a great way to start a film. Let me ask you: uh, it's hard to believe that this is uh, this situation happened. It's not that I, I think I read about it, and the guy went to jail and everything. <laughs> Why why did you choose to narrate this story, fictionalize the story to to tell us a, a horror movie, to build up a horror movie? Well, this was a, you know, this is true events. I'm, and I I mean, I love I love true crime. I love uh, suspense. Um, and I love, uh, you know, a thriller horror, the, you know, the whole nine yards. And um, just getting an opportunity to sink my teeth into this particular story, I thought would be... Um, I thought could it could I thought would be just really fascinating and um the woman who the story is based on you know she uh, first off a wonderful person but uh, she and I got together and you know she proceeded to tell me these um unsettling instances that she had with a white van uh and it was just one of those things that you know I could feel that that the hair on my arms stand up and I just thought, well, if that's the if that's happening right here while we're having a conversation, I can only imagine, you know, the result if we actually turn this into a script and ultimately into a film. Uh, and so, you know, that was um, that was sort of the, the the impulse of it all. And then really just finding a way to build the narrative around what happened to her, and then uh, working with the co-writer Sharon Cobb. You know, we wanted to find a unique what a unique way to to structure the story. And so that's where we sort of came up with the, um, you know, the chronological telling of Annie's storyline while simultaneously telling the um, descending order of victims um, from the man, the white van, and those two timelines converging on October, um, Halloween, 1974. Oh, let me ask you, it was very fr frustrating within the story the fact that nobody believes Annie and so it was like why don't you believe I mean this family seems to be perfect but it's kind of dysfunctional in a way I think could you talk about the family a little in the movie like Mark, yeah you know the, the, sister, it's, the parents yeah you know like look as a modern parent myself and even for Sean and Ali who started the film just the thought of considering not believing your child is it's unfathomable right um because they're you know the media's sort of sensationalized our fears um to be on the ready we expect the worst uh, we're terrified of everything and, and we're we are all you know sort of helicopter parents ready to protect our child at a moment's notice and in 1970 the 70s really didn't play out like that especially in small towns um like brooksville florida where you know i grew up in the 80s and even in the 80s you know i was a latchkey kid and you know i would kick open the door in the morning and and my parents had no idea where i was all day long you know drink out of a water hose we'd grab snacks out of a friend's house make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and we were on our dirt bikes and just out exploring the world um i can't tell you how many times one of us got you know really injured or you know a bad knee scrape up falling off a bike or whatever and you know we'd rub some dirt on it and move on with our day and you know now we call that grit um but, 
you know, there was, this was a time period in the 70s where, you know, parents were not helicoptering around. There was a, a certain trust in the world and a trust in the environment that the kids were okay. And um, to allow them to sort of venture out and, and be their own people and do their own thing. Um, and there certainly wasn't a uh, any kind of sense of alarm that anything nefarious was happening um, in small towns, you know, and in Brooksville, Florida, you know, even in talking with the detectives that sort of discovered what was happening back in 19, uh, 1981 with Billy Mansfield, you know, Brooksville was a town where you know, the worst thing that sort of happened, you know, the, the big police action was, you know, dealing with the town drunk on a Friday night at the bar, you mm -hmm. know, so there was no sense of, uh, you know, an overwhelming sense of, you know, murder or, or evil things happening in, in that area. So for the parents, you know, the disbelief sort of is rooted in that pride of small town, a pride of, you know, they are safe. They live in a, in a safe community um, because they don't want to think that anything bad, anything evil would be actually happening in, in, in their hometown. Now, uh, are there any secrets to make a, uh... A film like this work. I mean, there are moments in it which are really terrifying, and you feel for her, and and you really hate the the man behind the the wheel of the white van. Is there a van? Is there a, a secrets or a a way? Is it, uh, I don't know, like uh, rules to tell the story that can put the camera in a certain way, music. I mean, I think you know. I've, look, I think at the, I think the key component to it is finding a way that you can get the audience deeply rooted with your main character. And, you know, that was something that I was really cognizant of and wanted to make sure that, you know, the audience could, could be on Annie's journey that, you know, they would, they would, you know, kind of feel like they're on, you know, their path with her when she is, um, you know, this girl who's at kind of a crossroads in her life where she, you know, wants to be a kid still and, but on the precipice of becoming a young lady and, you know, having her first kiss and, you know, having that boy interest start developing and, you know, her, her best friend is all about the boys and she's not ready to jump in yet. So she's, you know, kind of holding herself back. And meanwhile, she has her older sister, you know, who really just wants her to jump full, full phase into being a, you know, a young lady and wants to, you know, get her to shave her legs and do makeup and do her hair and, and, and change her, you know, her, um, change her out of her, you know, tomboy, um, you know, attitude and, and clothes and everything. And, you know, Annie's not ready for that just yet. And so, you know, hopefully, you know, the audience sort of is with her in that way. We're like, we don't need to push her along yet. Like, let her, let her be on her own journey. And I think as long as we're, you sort of start with that, you know, rooting your main character in that way, um, once you're on their journey, then, um, then it's just a matter of, you know, the obstacles, and the terror that they start to face because now you are rooted with them. And so it's like, you're going on that same journey. How, how important is the soundtrack? I mean, the, yeah, the music, because I mean, it was so scary. Sometimes the music really takes you into a different place in a way. Well, uh, first off, I'll say uh, Scott Borland, Scott Thomas Borland, I should say, uh, who uh, composed all the original music for the film is, really brilliant. He's an instrumentalist and a songwriter. And I was so honored that he would uh, take on the film in the first place. Uh, and I just thought he did a great job in building out a, um, you know, we have a, a van theme and there's an alarm theme and just finding the different, you know, finding different textures in the film that, um, you know, I think, you know, it's not just it's not just a, a suspense thriller. There are, you know, elements of, you know, the sister story uh, in the film. So finding those, um, those textures and, you know, the kind of musical fabric to, to sort of lay in um, what's happening with those two, I, you know, to me was really important as well. Uh, and I thought he just did an extraordinary job really, um, you know, building out the score for that. I understand maybe I'm wrong, but I think I read somewhere that the film is being launched at a festival right now soon. Or... Yeah, so yeah, this... No, sorry, sorry. Yes. Sorry. No, you're you're 100 right. We uh, uh, are launching. They're having the world premiere at the Newport Beach Film Festival this weekend on Saturday the 14th, 7:30 p.m. Uh, 
and then um, we'll have a follow up screening there. And then I'm sure we'll we'll be playing at other film festivals. And uh, you know, while uh, the producers work out um, work out distribution. Sometimes uh, I don't know. Uh, sometimes within the film, you really want to meet the the guy behind the the driver of the minivan. I think it's good that you kept him mysterious, unknown, or blurry in a way. Yeah, you know, we, Sharon and I made a concerted effort because of the point of view that we were taking in this script, which was, which was Annie, our protagonist, and, you know, really building into her unsuspecting and unaware, you know, environment. It was important for us to maintain that POV. So if she doesn't know who the man is, then we didn't want the audience to know. Um, there's certainly a lot of films and, you know, that are very well done and some of my favorites where, you know, the antagonist is really a huge presence um, and you see their faces all the time and you can get all the, you know, the, the nasty villain expressions and, um, you know, and it's used to great effect. Uh, in this story, we really wanted the van to essentially be the extension of the villain uh, and be that shark, that great white shark in the water swimming about, um, you know, and taking victims. Um, you know, and, and the other part of it is that we really wanted this story to be about the uh, about Annie as a victim and subsequently the other victims. Uh, and we really didn't want to put a face, um, you know, to uh, to Billy Mansfield in the in the film. So uh, is this your directorial debut, I think? It is. You know, I've uh, I've directed I've directed television. I've directed the documentary uh, Thespians about the largest high school theater competition in the world. Completely different genre documentary. I had a blast doing that. But, you know, my heart, what I love doing um, or what, I, you know, the, I love genre. I love suspense, thriller, horror. So to uh, be able to make my my narrative scripted directorial debut with this particular project was uh, was special, and uh, I look forward to you know being able to uh, you know get the opportunity to do something like this again. What was the impact of being part of the Walking Dead? Very successful show, everybody saw it, and that put you in a different position, maybe within the industry. I don't know. The Walking Dead. Oh, you know what? I I think you're confused. I'm not involved with Walking Dead, but uh, the actor Daniel, a plays the younger brother, he is involved in the Walking Dead. Because I read something. I'm sorry. I thought you were part. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it, it probably yeah. Gavin Gavin's last name is Warren. So maybe maybe that's where confusion was. But yeah, he's actually involved in Fear of the Walking Dead and uh, was just cast in another James Wan film. Uh, so I'm really excited for for Gavin. He's he's a real yeah. He I mean that kid is so great just personally, but um, he's super talented as well. And and you know what he brought to the table as the younger brother, a little Spitfire, I thought was uh, was fantastic and you know a great ingredient um, in the the texture of the film. 